Hi, everyone. It's Jeff Fisher of High School Football America, joined today by former NFL receiver and now the uh, head coach at Cherry Creek High School in Colorado and also the voice of the, uh, the radio voice of the Denver Broncos, Dave Logan. Thanks for taking some time with us today, Dave. Hey, morning, Jeff. How are you? I'm doing great. Let's uh, let's talk about uh, uh, something pretty fresh in your mind, which is a state championship. And that's where we want to start. We'll kind of go back from there. I read at the beginning of the season uh, that you uh, you guys had, what, three uh, offensive players coming back and a, and a defensive player. And I think along the way, you may have said this is one of your more rewarding coaching jobs. Talk a little bit about this year's challenge and how well the kids met it for you. Well, it. Uh... It was a terrific year. You know, we uh, we had won the state championship the previous two years. And last year we had a senior dominated team with um, an unbelievable amount of talent, just great kids that have pretty much started since they were sophomores. And so we lost uh, 34, maybe 35 seniors last year. And so this was somewhat of a transitional year for sure. We had some talented kids, but kids that were, um, primarily underclassmen that had not had the opportunity really to um, make their own mark. And when you're back-to-back -back state champions, obviously you have a, you have a bullseye on your chest. You couple that with, uh, we had an inordinate amount of injuries this year. Um, uh, you know, just football, uh, football injuries, a broken leg, four dislocated shoulders. We had a torn ACL with our, lead running back. And so there, there were a lot of bumps in the road. And so for the kids to rally as they did, and we lost a couple of games. We went down and played a very good Chandler team in Arizona that is nationally ranked. And then we lost an in-state game as well. Um, and at that point, I think a lot of people uh, may have uh, overlooked us a bit and thought this was, this was not going to be our year, but for our kids, I'm really proud of the fact that they rallied and they, uh, they were very focused during this playoff run and we played our best football without question in late October and through November and, and actually into December last Saturday, the championship game. And you got to do it uh, there in the, uh, the, the employer's backyard, the home of the Denver Broncos and power field at mile high. Uh, talk a little bit about um, what it means to you as a, a guy that played in the league. Uh, you're still employed in the National Football League. And to know that a team like the Broncos and the rest of the teams out there around the league are doing their coaches of the week. And, and a lot of uh, stadiums like this week, for example, uh, in New Orleans, the Saints are hosting the, the Louisiana State Championships. What does it mean to you to know that the league is giving back to the roots of the game? Well, I think it's terrific. I think it's, um, I think it's very smart by the league. I think that uh, the game of football uh, we've seen so many changes in the last few years. I think most of those have been good changes with respect to player safety. I think back, I played in the mid-70s to mid-80s, and uh, there were a lot of things that went on uh, on the field with respect to wide receivers that uh, are not allowed today. And I'm glad. I'm glad for these guys that are playing today. Uh, and I think the league understands that they have to reach out and embrace youth football all the way down to little league football. Right. And because yep. you're seeing uh, you're seeing declining numbers, uh, you know, not not to the point that you would become overly concerned, but concerned enough that we have to, I think, as stewards of the game and the league is just that we have to point out the the positives, all the positives that are involved in playing the game of football. It's the greatest team game uh, in the world. Um, it teaches a lot of life lessons. It teaches perseverance. It teaches uh, you the ability to get up when knocked down, literally uh, and figuratively. Uh, it teaches that hard work and, and being selfless and pointing towards uh, team goals can benefit everybody in, in a society, frankly, that now points to all the individuals I think way too many times. Um, so we celebrate the, the team concept uh, that football teaches. And so I think the league has really stepped up and, and done a, a very good job in the last few years, as I said, embracing that and cultivating uh, youth football. Take us back to, to your early days. Um, you, you were a multi-sport athlete, so I'm, I'm assuming as a, a youngster, probably eight, nine, and 10 before you got to high school, you were playing a bunch of sports and all that. But, you know, what, what was it about the game of football that you remember from your youth that to this day brings a smile to your face? 
Right. Well, you're right. I did love all sports. I mean, I couldn't wait to when one sport ended, it was time to get into the other one. I was a baseball, football, basketball guy. And so I just stayed very, very busy, which I think uh, retrospectively uh, was probably good for me. It kept me out of trouble, at least most of the time. But um, again, I think football uh, I, I, and I love basketball and I love baseball, but I think football is the, the greatest team sport in the world. Right. You can have um, you can have a dominant pitcher in baseball that pretty much can shut the other team down and you can win a game. Even if, if the players behind that pitcher are not necessarily great players, you can have a dominant post player or a dominant three point shooter um, that can, can lead his team more times than not to victory. But in football, you are ever so dependent on each other. And so I think football is a game that just teaches, um, people how to interact and people how to reach out and understand that they're not nearly as good by themselves as they are working within a team environment and having goals that might not necessarily be individual goals, but, but are collectively team goals that we all can realize. And I think it also empowers coaches um, at, at least at the high school level to, to validate every one of their players. You don't play, you don't play your players the same amount of time, but every one of every one of those players is important and every one of them has a role, right? And every one of them can get better, a little bit better in practice. I challenge my players all the time, find something today that you can improve upon, whether it's your stance or your get off or your hand placement as an offensive lineman, something that you can improve upon. And then we try to stack those days on top of each other as we move on. Tell us a little bit about the journey into the coaching profession, which we all love and we know the importance that coaches play in young men's lives these days on the football field. So you're, you're coming out of the league mid 80s ish there. And uh, at what point does it dawn on you that that maybe the, the coaching profession could be part of what you want to do moving forward? Well, you know, my mom and dad always talked about if I had the opportunity to give back and work with with uh, with youth. My dad was a was a uh, basketball coach and a football coach, Pee Wee in, in Little League stuff. And so with that, that was always in the back of my mind. And when I retired from the league uh, and started doing radio and TV, I always, in the back of my mind, wanted to try to figure how can I balance me starting this other career and still wanting to work with kids and give back and, uh, and coach football. And so I had a, I had a very... Uh, a big mentor in my life, probably the, the single biggest male mentor other than my father was my middle school football coach. And he was coaching high school football. And he asked me to come out um, and just work with the offense, work with the passing game of the team that he was coaching. And so I couldn't, I just started the radio and TV career. And so I, I, I couldn't get out there every single day in the afternoons, but I could get out there taking vacation days, a couple of days a week. And when I did that, um, you know, it just, it, it just reinforced to me how much that I really, I really wanted to do that. So uh, a couple of years later, a job opened up and he encouraged me to apply for it. Um, I, at that point, was doing a nighttime show so I could devote uh, the necessary time to spend with kids and, uh, and do that in the afternoons. And I applied for the job that the coach had left there after 27 years, he left in June. Um, and so it limited the amount of good coaches that could apply for that job, I think, which was probably in my favor because I had no background in coaching and I applied for the job. Unfortunately, uh, I got it. And here 29, this is my 29th season. We sit here uh, having a conversation. Yeah. And let's let's give your middle school coach some props there. What, what, what's his name? So we, we know who he is. He yeah, he passed. He passed in October, which was really difficult. Uh, his name was Jim Temple. Uh, just a uh, salt of the earth, man, guy that taught me so much, uh, you know, about life, about, uh, all the things that I've mentioned before about the importance of teamwork, about, uh, uh, working together as a team, just a lot of things that, uh, that my mom and dad taught me as well. Coach Temple reinforced, uh, and we were, we were lifelong friends right until the end.
Oh, sorry to hear about his passing. Let's, let's talk about some of the other guys that made an impact from a standpoint. And I always say this when I do the interviews, right? We know coaches. I started using the word steal, but now I say borrow, right? There's nothing new or original out there. So is there anybody uh, from your past coaching wise that when you're blowing the whistle or, or talking to the young men, you're like, that's coach so-and-so out of my past. Oh man, I've, I've been so blessed in my career uh, to have played for uh, a lot of great coaches. You know, my first couple of years in the league, I played uh, played for Forrest Gregg, who was a, a great Hall of Famer, Green Bay Packer, uh, played for Coach Vince Lombardi. And Vince Lombardi once said that Forrest Gregg was his best player, and he had a lot of great, great players. But, uh, you know, from Coach Gregg, I learned uh, discipline, uh, very, very tough-minded, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of the um, things up front on both sides of the ball in terms of being able to stop the run and being able to run the ball. I also, uh, I played for, in a, in, for a brief time for Mike Shanahan. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike was my receiver coach my last year in the league when I got traded from Cleveland to Denver. He was the receiver coach at Denver. I wasn't with the Broncos very long, but I got to know him and certainly have remained great friends with him. And I think he is one of the great, great offensive minds in all of football in terms of uh, West Coast offense and how he runs it from different formations. And so those two guys, those two guys would be, uh, uh, would come to the forefront. My, my roommate as a Cleveland Brown, the last couple of years was Bill Cower, who was the uh, head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And Bill and I have remained great friends and have shared ideas in terms of just uh, football philosophy. So I, I've been blessed in a very long career of hanging around a lot of guys that uh, were, were what I call football guys. These are guys that love football, that understand it, that, that live it, um, and are always trying to become better coaches every single day of the year. I know you're very, very busy with your job with the Broncos as the as the play by play voice and you know you can't do it alone of course head coaches nowadays are CEOs of their high school football programs and I, I know you have a lot of respect for your assistant coaches you've donated your salary to them tell the listeners and the viewers here a little bit about your approach to being that CEO and delegating to the guys and putting the trust in them to, to carry out that vision for you. Well, you know what? It's diff difficult, Jeff, I think, to find, um, you know, when you hire a high school staff, you, you want you want guys. I mean, there, there are certain requirements that you're looking for. You want guys that are going to be great with kids, that are going to be great role models with uh, with the young men. You want guys that have a certain level of football acumen. And then you want guys that are going to be willing to work for about six cents an hour. So um, it's it, it can be difficult to. Uh, you know, you can find one or two or two of two of the three, but it's difficult to find all three. And so I've been blessed. My staff, uh, the core group of my staff, I've got four or five guys that have been with me 20 plus years that are just uh, great teachers. I mean, a football coach is a teacher. Um, I, I, I really believe that. I mean, we, we interact with those young men during the fall probably more than their parents do and probably more than any other particular teacher does because we get them. Uh, in meetings where we get them on the field and we're constantly, um, you know, looking at their grades and there's just a lot of stuff like that that goes on. But I think that, um, you know, football coaches, uh, and it's not this way nationwide, but football coaches in Colorado, uh, and I've said this before, it's, uh, you know, they, they work for very, very little. I think it's, I, I, you know, I would like to see that changed uh, before I retire in some capacity. I'm blessed that, um, that I have other means of income with radio and TV, but, but a lot of these football coaches are teachers. And then the stipend that they get to coach football, and football is not just, it used to be just you know late August and you'd be done in November. If you really want to run a program that is competitive and a championship caliber program, I mean, we start in June. We go four mornings a week in June, the first Monday in June. And so all of my guys, even if they have to, even if they can't get there for the lifting and the running, all of my guys come during their lunch break. And that's when we install the offense and the defense. And so it's a, it's a real, real commitment. And I certainly would like to see uh, those men compensated fairly. 100% agree with you on that. When you do, and, and you said you've had guys with you for a long time, but when you do get a youngster, a guy that's, you know, maybe just, you know, gotten out of college, wants to go back 
you know, give back to the, the high school that he played at maybe and wants to coach. So what are some of the questions that you ask a guy that's in front of you? Because again, they're making peanuts. What's a, what's a good thing that a, a guy watching this right now who wants to get into the profession should be prepared for when he gets into that interview situation? Yeah, I think, I think it's important that, uh, at least for me, I, w- I want to know why he wants to coach. Hmm. What's, the, what's the end game? Are you looking to go coach in college? Um, are you looking to make this a profession? Uh, what do you do now for a living? Do you understand the time commitment involved? It's not just showing up at four o'clock in the afternoon, rolling up in your car and getting out and saying, hey, what are we going to do today? There's a lot of pre-planning that goes on and practice scripts, uh, those type things. And so they have, to, they, have to, they have to be willing to, from a time commitment standpoint, they have to be willing to completely understand what's going to be asked of them. It, it doesn't do any good if you say, well, I mean, I can't be there in the summer coach, but I can be there, you know, three or four days in the fall. That's great, but that's, that's, that's not going to work, right? Because, you know, you have to build as a position coach as well as a head coach, but you have to build bonds with those players. Those players have to see you. I tell my players, listen, my commitment to you is I'm not missing one single day in the summer. Right. I could be out playing golf. We could all be doing a lot of other things. My golf game is terrible uh, uh, because I don't play it enough. But you know what? My commitment is to those kids. And and I want members of my staff that are of like mind that are going to do whatever it takes to spend the necessary time. And then that means, you know, we meet uh, when we meet on Sunday. Sometimes it's even after a Broncos game and it could go till 10 or 11 o'clock at night. You've got to be willing to. There's a certain amount. I mean, College coaches and NFL coaches talk about the sacrifice, and I understand that. I've had chances to go coach in the NFL, and I just didn't want to be that guy moving from from town to town. But there's a a certain, not quite as much, but a certain level of sacrifice that you have to be willing to make as a high school coach as well. So those would be some of the questions that I would certainly ask a, a potential coach. Penn State championships, the only high school football coach in America to win four championships uh, or sco- uh, championships at four different schools. 29 years later, my question to you is this. You said you kind of went in with no experience, so to speak, other than you played for coaches. Where is the biggest growth for Dave Logan as a coach and also as a human being during that stretch? Well, wow. um... I think as a coach, what I've always believed is whenever you start thinking um, you finally got it figured out, that's when that's when you start <laughs> losing. Um, and so every single year, we'll go back and look at what we've accomplished the previous year. And we have a checklist of things that we absolutely have to improve upon. Um, I, I think you have to be open-minded. I mean, we've changed, we haven't changed our philosophy, but we've changed, you know, offensive structure over the years. Um, I, I, I will tell you this, I'm a firm believer, even in the, in the era of passing the football a lot, and we, we throw it a fair amount too. It, it, football gets back to the basic idea of you have to be able to run the ball and you have to be able to stop the run. And if you can't do that, all the X's and O's and all of the, it's one thing to sit in a room and gosh, I've been blessed to talk to a lot of very, very smart coaches, uh, college coaches, NFL coaches, high school coaches, some of the best coaches that I've run into are high school coaches, right? Nobody will ever really know of them, but uh, they're very, very bright football people. And it's one thing to sit up on a board and talk about passing concepts and pass protections and release five in the in the route um it's another thing to practically look at your team and be able to say okay this year we lost our entire offensive line and so coming back i've got a sophomore left tackle i've got a junior left guard uh, they're undersized so i i think it's important at the high school level because you have to retool almost every single year because of graduation uh, it's important to be able to look at your team and say, well, this is what we did last year. But you know what? Of these five things we were really good at last year, two or three of those probably are not going to work this year. So we've got to be able to adapt to the personnel that we have. And I think we've done a reasonably good job uh, in that regard. In terms of growth as a person, 
um, I, I, even, even when I first started, I, I was so uh, aware of and intentional with uh, wanting to um, have a relationship with my players mm -hmm. and uh, be there for my players, both on the field and off the field. And players, what players want, I know NFL players want this too, but high school players want this as well is they want, they want to coach. If you want to be able to coach, I think, in the league, in the NFL, you've got to be able to stand in front of a room full of men and say, listen, here's, here's what we're going to do. Here's how I can help you become a better player. Mm -hmm. If you become a better player, then collectively, we're going to become a better team, right? I can help you if you'll let me coach you. Sometimes in the NFL, and even in high school, uh, players are reticent to, to allow coaches to coach them. And I say, listen, I'm going to coach you hard. You got to let me coach you. You got to let our staff coach you. Uh, I'm going to love you, but but I'm going to, you know, I'm going to I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to get on your fanny sometimes, and uh, you're you're probably not going to like it much, and that's okay. And I'll walk off the field with my arm around you and tell you I love you. But I think as long as you're honest with your players, because players can see through coaches that are not honest. If you're if you're honest with them and you tell them you love them and you show them you love them then more times than not, they'll run through walls for you. Farron, question to ask you, uh, the most enjoyment you've gotten through this great career, whether it's been in the NFL or as a, a very well-accomplished high school coach, which one puts a bigger smile on your face? A, a good day on Sunday or uh, a championship at Cherry Creek or Mullen or all the other schools? Well, I mean, I love my time as a player, right? I, uh, you know, I miss the guys. Um, I don't miss the, the injuries, you know, I don't miss the Monday mornings, uh, too much. And I've been out of the league since 85. Uh, but I miss, I miss the, the locker room and I miss the camaraderie and I miss the, uh, the relationships and I miss that feeling. It's, it's a feeling that I think, um, if you could find and you could bottle, you would be the, the wealthiest person in the world. The feeling that you have in a locker room when, um, as an NFL player, when you're on the road and you've gone out and you've warmed up and you come back in and you can hear the crowd making noise outside and you look in that locker room and it's just, you know what, guys are sweaty and getting ready to go to battle and you can look at each other and, and there's just a feeling there that, um, you know, it's just us against everybody else out there. You know, it's an it's a feeling of accountability. I've got to hold up my end of the deal. When the ball's thrown to me, I got to find a way to make the catch because I'm not going to let these other 52 guys in the locker room down. I miss that feeling uh, very, very much. But I will tell you this, and it's been this way for all 29 years. I get so amped up um, when 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 coaching high school football and seeing these guys that have put in all this work and these kids that have bought in and they've sacrificed and now they're going into their own battle. And I, I'm trying to, you know, I never, I never pray for wins, but I pray that, uh, that the good Lord will allow me not to screw this up for my kids. Um, you know, so because you feel, you, you just feel accountable for them. You, the, these are your guys and you're trying to put them in positions where they can succeed. And, and ultimately it's one, one of the things I truly love about football I mean, there's a score. They keep score. Too often in life now, you know, there's not a scoreboard. I think there's a scoreboard in virtually every single thing you do. But when there is and when it matters um, and you put everything into it, if, if you don't wind up with more points than the opposition, man, that's a tough thing. It just sucks the life out of you. And that, that's, that's hurtful for me as a coach with my kids. Yeah. And uh, we're going to go out here on a, on a high note. Uh, I use the word note in parentheses here because I read somewhere that uh, in addition to being a pretty good athlete, you played the trombone in high school. Is that, is that a, a true story? Is that uh, <laughs> fake news? No, that is a, that is a true story. I was a, uh, you know, I was raised uh, uh, to love music. My dad was in the uh, El Jebel Shrine marching band. So I'd go to band practice with him. He was a trombonist. And so I, I wasn't any good. Uh, but I've always loved music. I think I think I was the fourth chair uh, trombonist, and and there were four chairs, so I think I was last. But I was in stage band. I was in uh, symphonic orchestra. 
I was in jazz band. I just have always had a had a real love for music. So the only thing I, I didn't do, I was not in the marching band for obvious reasons. Yeah. I was going to ask you, I've seen guys do that. I've seen them take off yeah. the pads and start playing at halftime. Well, coach, thank you so much. Uh, I know your schedule is very busy and we really appreciate you taking the time, but more importantly, we appreciate you taking time with student athletes uh, there in, uh, in Colorado and uh, just continued success and uh, God bless. Appreciate you, Jeff. Thanks for having me.